As always, this episode is sponsored by my go-to stop for all things makeup, Revlon. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today we are talking to Casey Neistat. Casey is a filmmaker and boundary-breaking creator. He's a world-class trailblazer and business owner who has inspired generations to do the impossible. In this episode, we talk about insane stunts, family, making your own rules, and so much more. Casey Neistat, everybody! <laughs> this, yeah, this is... Are you usually on podcasts, like, productions this big? No. Yeah, In fact, when we were so. emailing earlier today, I was like, is this just, like, a recording thing, or are we going to be on camera? Or do I need to look cute? Yeah, a full face of makeup. I know, Been I in it. hair, like, for hours. I'm so excited to talk to you because you, first of all, you're, like, the king of YouTube. You started before everybody. Thank you, you are the man. You have way more videos than I could even like go and research. I was you getting haven't tired. seen all of them? No. Oh. Don't even play games. Let me take this off. Okay, take it off. <laughs> Wait, but you know people who've seen them all? No, there's like a thousand videos. I, I haven't seen them all. Oh, shut up. I've seen them all. No, when we when I, we were doing season one of Pretty Big Deal at 368, mm -hmm. which is your office. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There was paparazzi hanging out outside of your office. You're a pretty big deal, bro. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, it's like 12 year old kids that want to take selfies. I know, it's fairness. so crazy. They're, yeah, they're really sweet. It's so crazy. Yeah. You have this like rebellious spirit and you've now turned it into something that makes you money. But where do you feel like this re rebellious spirit came from? My wife's got me in therapy. Okay, I know, I've seen some of those videos. Which. <laughs> <laughs> with your wife. Which is fantastic, <laughs> by the way. Okay. Like, and I even have like a new doctor out here since we've just moved to California. Do you like California? I love it. It's fantastic. Oh, interesting. It's fantastic. But being in therapy, like, it, it, it's forced me to be a little bit more introspective and try to understand, like, where does, like, the rebellious spirit come from and, you know, how you get to where, how you become the person that you are. Right, right. I lived in a very small kind of lower middle class, like, military industrial town mm -hmm. where like m all my friends parents built submarines mm. yeah like when reagan left office all of my friends moved away because there were budget cuts to the military and all my friends parents lost their jobs like that's what i remember from my childhood whoa in connecticut in connecticut in southeastern connecticut yeah this is like the late 80s early 90s there was sort of like a fairly rigid kind of conservatism there that it just didn't bode well for me i never felt like i fit in mm -hmm. and when you don't feel like you fit in and that's furthered by traditional teachers that when somebody stands out they're kind of i was made to feel like wrong mm -hmm. that energy was kind of sublimated into like okay i don't fit in here this isn't working mm -hmm. i feel wrong i feel small how do i break away from this and be somewhere where i can thrive and kind of like not to sound cliche but like kind of be myself and still succeed right because you didn't want to be around people who doubted you yeah and that's tough like when you're coming from you know, like a, the public school that I went to, which was like, I can remember like two teachers right. that were okay with me being different or thinking different or wanting to learn differently. Did you have ADD or dyslexia? Yeah, all that stuff. Same. And I feel like I went through a very similar thing. It was like, I didn't learn like the other kids. They put me in a special ed program because they just didn't know how to help me read. It was, it just sounds very similar. But I just feel like if more public schools understood that about their students, people like you and I would thrive in, in class. I think so, yeah. I think and so. Like my, I, my older son, Owen, who you know went through like he went to the school that he went to is just up the street from the school that I went to when yeah. he was young in Connecticut. Like he did really well. He did. He did really well. And you had him at seventeen. Yeah, it was. Hold on, I can tell you exactly. It was sixteen days after my seventeenth birthday. Holy moly! Great time. Sixteen to have kids. and pregnant. Just kidding. It's not a great. No, time. I know. My... No teenagers. If teenagers at home don't have children. <laughs> Wait, what was that like? I mean, it was wonderful, and I can say I felt like it was wonderful then. Can and you say back, wonderful now? Yeah, absolutely. I can say wonderful now with more confidence than I could have said it then. Yeah. But I, I left home when I was fifteen. Okay. 
And then, like, my first girlfriend got her pregnant because that's what stupid teenagers do. <laughs> like, why don't they teach you how that stuff works? I'm it, from Nebraska, you know. Yeah, I get it. obviously it wasn't planned or expected right. to be that age. Right. But I remember finding out she was pregnant mm. and just being like, okay, let's do this. Like, finally, like, I mean, I'm only 17, but this is the first time I get to show that I can be responsible. Wow. I, like, I remember very deliberately that feeling, that sentiment towards it. Did he kind of push you towards the man that you feel like you are today? Yeah, I mean, you're about to learn this very soon. I'm asking a lot of parents a lot of baby questions. I have so many answers. I'm, I'm, we're gonna get to it. Okay. But I gotta like, you know, we gotta get there. We're getting there. Yeah. But no, with, with Owen, it was like, even at that young age, it sort of felt like I had a purpose. Mm -hmm. What was your purpose? You just felt like that was a cliche moment, didn't I, you? Yeah, I was like, oh, God, I'm rolling <laughs> my eyes, eyes at myself. yourself. <laughs> it, it, what I mean by that is it was like, if my, if my motivating force prior to having this kid was just like to rebel, like literally my motivating force was just to say fuck you to like the people who told me that I, I was a loser. Right. All of a sudden I had this like beautiful little boy and my motivating force was to give him the life that maybe I wished I had had. Mm. And that's a much more sort of virtuous flame to keep the fire going than like wanting to show people your middle finger. Right. And that like that drives me through to today. I think like that's everything that I've ever done or that's everything beautiful. that I've ever wanted to do is because of like that amazing kid. Well, you've done a lot when you were younger. Like, at 19, you had a video that went viral before YouTube was even a thing. Necessity is the mother of invention. There you go. You can you tell? Options. But can you tell us about that video? Because I watched it and I was like, this is brilliant! Well, but why haven't people thought of this? Because nobody was thinking about it. Are you talking about the iPod video? Yeah, thank you. So it was early. It was really I early. I mean, you had really long hair. You had cherry that's what, like, Yeah, that's what, like, very young Casey looks yes. like. But... <laughs> The history of that movie was just, it was like, you know, I, I moved to New York City when I was, I was 19 and like really had nothing and no idea. I just promised myself I wouldn't work in a restaurant kitchen. Mm. That was the only rule I gave myself. That's all I'd ever done. Mm. My whole professional life from age 14 to like 20, I'd only wash dishes. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've got a 10th grade education, a lot of experience washing dishes and a two year old. And I got to figure this out. And I wanted to make movies. And so you all moved from Connecticut to New York? No, it was just like me. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. It's, you were like, I'm determined. I, was like, I'm gonna figure I had a three-month sublet. Was there rats? I had bucks. rats in mind. We had a lot of rats. Whew, that's a New York life. When you got a hustle and it's a three-month sublet, that was my first apartment too. Disgusting. It was like a really narrow sublet? Yeah. Three months, roaches in the cupboard, rats at night. But I did it because there was a dream. Yeah, I moved to New York City, did nothing. Yes. And I just knew I wanted to make movies. And making movies then, this is like... You know, 2001, making a movie meant making it, finding the money. Yeah, doing a production and then getting it to a film festival. That was right. the dream. And I never had those resources. So I'd make these little movies and there was no place for them then. There was no outlet for them. Actually, like the place where I put them before YouTube was born, I called them fine art. And my brother Van and I would literally like show our little three minute movies, which are absolutely YouTube videos in museums and art galleries and places like that. So it's the only place they fit in. So then what was, how did you come up with this brilliant idea so the, to make the stencil? The iPod movie was just, I had, was super, super fucking broke, but I got the first iPod. I don't know if you remember, yes. the wheel on that actually turned. Yes, I do remember. Of course, I mean. I, and it was so exciting, but like a year and a half later, the battery died. And when I called Apple, they're like, we're not going to replace the battery. But so you our, recorded it. How did you know to I record I called them it? back. I thought maybe it was just like a lazy guy and, on tech support. And I was like, my battery's dead. And he's like, you know, it's our policy to recommend you just buy a new one. And I was so offended. So I called back and I recorded it. And when he said that, I was like, there's a movie here. <gasps> so my brother Van and I, we cut a stencil. We went around to like those like it was the stencil. shadows. Yeah, yeah. The shadows like the, that were dancing. The silhouette with like the fluorescent yes. pink color behind it. And so we did like what was like an effect of like a cigarette disclaimer. But at the bottom of every <laughs> ad, it said iPod's unreplaceable battery lasts only 18 months. Did you have any idea how viral this was going to go? And I mean, first of all, let me just tell everybody, in one month you had 6 million views, but where? I don't know if you remember, before social media and YouTube, to share something, you had to like, copy URL, control C, email, new, control V, and then start typing in names. Right. That was the only way to share it. And, and, and even with that, that's how it went super viral. How did you keep up with the 6 million views? I'm very confused. That was like a huge hurdle because you had to pay for bandwidth with your ah. service provider. And so it kept getting shut down. So like on the splash page, I put up a notice that was like, can you help us 
host this. Interesting. And like a bunch of different places, like one university is like, we got it. And then like it shut down the university servers. And they're like, we can't, we can't host it. We're kicking you off. And it went on and on. But and, now you got mad street cred. But I got, <laughs> I got that mad street cred. But the finish line of that story is very funny. The hosting place that I ultimately found was at the time, Apple had a product called like iDisc. I think it's called iDisc. I never had that one. And basically it was like for eight bucks a month or 12 bucks a month, you'd have like a certain amount of, of online space so you could share your baby pictures with family and things like that. Okay. But the bandwidth was unlimited. So ultimately Apple flipped the bill for all the bandwidth to make the movie about the Apple's, yeah. Oh, yeah. ultimate street cred. Yes. Hello, make a money. Yeah. So you were an indie filmmaker. Yeah, it was just funny because then it wasn't like a, that wasn't filmmaking. Well, I mean, it today was, it is. Today it is, but there's no definition around that kind of filmmaking then. Right, and then you had a show on HBO. Yeah. You're, which you were, um, am I jumping? Well, there's like a good eight years of tumult between those two things, but yes, yeah, sequentially. I don't wanna, I know, I hate on. it when people do that because then it's like, oh, I did that and then boom, I got something. No, there's hard work that goes into everything. Yeah, we made that fun viral video, my yes. brother Van and I, and then for like the next six years, we were like starving, like struggling, never, struggling to pay rent, and like, remember we got to stay at this girl's house once for free because she needed somebody to house sit her cats. She was supposed to come back for three weeks, but a month later she hadn't come back, and I couldn't afford cat food to feed her cats. <laughs> oh my god! So they went on a very strict diet. Oh my goodness! It was them or me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love animals. Yes. What was I supposed I to do? It. Starving. I get it. So okay, so viral video, eight years. Then you had the YouTube sh uh, show, or no HBO, HBO show. show yeah. But then you had to choose between YouTube and TV. Yeah, it was I like, want to talk about that decision because that's a big one. A lot of people probably would not have chosen at your time. Yeah, I think now it makes sense. Now yeah. we know. But 10 years ago, which is yeah, more than 10 2009. years ago. Yeah, like 2009, 2010. We made this show, my brother Van and me. And like, it's just like a YouTube video. We wrote it, we directed it, we shot it on little cameras, we edited it in iMovie. Like we made this show that HBO believed in so much that they bought it. It was like the first time we ever had money. And it was this huge deal. And we like celebrated it. And it was like in the local paper. And I was like, look, mom, I did it. And like <laughs> all that. And then like the show didn't play on air for two years. Wow. Yeah. For reasons unbeknownst. To, like, I don't know. Right. Um, okay. They had the reasons, but it just didn't air for two years. And when it did air, it was on like Friday nights at midnight. All right. Nobody's going to see that. We, it, it was very well reviewed, but it was like, yeah, nobody could see it. And I really felt beaten. Like I felt defeated after that. I felt like. I thought I had done something. It's like climbing to the top of the mountain, and I finally get to the top, and I'm going like this, and then I turn around, and it's like, oh, shit, you're kidding me. Wow. Like I, I haven't started. And after leaving that, like, I wanted more control, more agency over. But how do you go from feeling so defeated to finally making a decision where it's really the unknown? Because walking into YouTube is the unknown. Well, I knew that I couldn't succeed the way I wanted to succeed in like that space. I, I just knew I couldn't because I did it. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I felt like it was the biggest deal. Like Van and I made that show, it was just us. And then HBO, The Sopranos, this is Sex in the City, this is the golden years of HBO. Like we did it. Right. And it just didn't work. Like, it it like, didn't work. <sighs> How far after going into YouTube did you do that Nike commercial? Because that was my vibe. That was... You took all this money, Nike gave you how much money? I don't think I've ever said publicly how much money it was, but it's way less than you'd think. I mean, I can say it now. What is it, like 20K? No, I think it was closer to, it, the deal was to make three videos for Nike. Okay. To launch their new product. And I mean, I think, they had to give you enough where you guys could take planes. I think the, for the, I think the budget for the whole thing was like $250,000, which is a tremendous amount of money. It is. But the first two videos were very expensive to produce. Okay. Because they were like proper Nike commercials. I loved this video. I mean, this was like, oh my God, I want to put on my sneakers. I want to travel the world. Like, come on, let's do this. Like, did you get that kind of feedback? Yeah. It was like the most watched video Nike had ever done online until like their the world next world cup came up and they made some amazing stuff but like it really had an impact a really big spot you know what i love and that like now it's like been kind of a reoccurrence even in this conversation is that you're doing things that nobody did before you're the first you're the one who has to kind of convince these people to either give you money put you on do you get tired of having to tell people who you are or take a chance on you I mean, now you probably... Now I don't, now it's, now it's just... But then, like a how did you not feel so defeated at a younger age? I didn't have a choice. It's like I, if you don't know the way you're supposed to do things, then you have to forge your own path. It's like if, if there isn't a map, 
to tell you how to get to where you want to go, then you have to like knock down trees and figure it out. Create your own. Yeah. So when I was like, whatever, 26 years old, trying to make a TV show on HBO, I didn't know how you're supposed to make a TV show. So we just did our best. And when I was starting to get advertising opportunities, starting to, uh, opportunities to actually make money off of my creativity or whatever you want to call it at the time, I didn't know how to do it the traditional way. So I only knew how to do it one way, which is mm -hmm. like, no, I don't need your production help. I don't need an agency. Just like, if you just give me a little bit of money, I'll make something that is good. Right. Or, uh, as best as I can make it. And so like, yeah, in retrospect, it sounds very thoughtful and insightful, but the reality was much more sort of brute force and ignorance than it was strategic. Brute force and ignorance. Yeah. I like it. So I like it. I think that more young people need to remind, be reminded of this and just do it blindly sometimes. Yeah. And I think that... And hard work because you well, have always a put part. a lot of hard work into this. I think h hard work and patience are two wildly undervalued aspects of, of trying to forge your own way in, mm -hmm. in this world. Mm -hmm. Very few people are patient. Patience is really scary. It is. And then working hard is something that is undervalued. It definitely is. So I was telling you earlier how you so graciously gave us your space at 368 to shoot Pretty Big Deal first season. And I, I need some advice. Like, I just want to know, like, first of all, how's my content doing? Do you like my videos? Am I like, am I up to speed? I want to be best in class, brother. I mean, I can't tell if you're fishing for compliments because I only have nice things. No! I'm serious. You're the king of YouTube, and I'm kind of like a newbie here. I've really only been around on YouTube for a year. Okay, here's the thing. A, a lot of celebrities, a lot of people who succeeded first in other aspects of media, yeah. like you have, right. historically would come to YouTube with this sort of like ethos that was often rejected by the YouTube community and the YouTube audience. Mm -hmm. This is like, I'm thinking like 2013, 14, 15. And now there's a new generation of people who have really found success elsewhere mm -hmm. and have been able to bring their true selves to the internet, to YouTube, right. which is all YouTube gives a shit about. Like, I don't care how cool you are. If I don't believe you, you're not going to work on this platform. Because you can't face tune a YouTube channel. You can't face <laughs> So when I think of like what Carly Kloss has done. Yes, love. We all do. Aww. But she's just this incredible person. But her, her presence, her sort of aura, like what people know about her, is not always determined by her. It's mm -hmm. determined by how she wants to be portrayed by the, the videographer, her latest runway mm -hmm. show. Or a retouched photo. Retouched photo, cover. how an interview that she did is edited. Mm -hmm. So by her saying, like, screw it, let me make YouTube videos that are authentically her, you're able to access this person and then make it like an objective decision. Like, do I like this person or not? Mm -hmm. And of course you're going to like that person. Will right. Smith. I, oh my gosh, he's killing it. He's the greatest. And we right. all know he's the greatest, but like now I get to see him be himself. Be and I get himself. to see him be goofy and like I love his take videos. his family on hikes in Malta or <laughs> the fuck they were in that awesome video. Like it's endearing. You're like, oh my God, he is just like the rest of us. And then so, you love him. So basically just continue to be myself. Which you're very good at. You're very good at it. Thank you. But a lot of a lot of people that have found success in like the mainstream the, the more traditional aspects of media don't get the opportunity to show their true selves. They don't. And this is why I also wanted to create this YouTube channel, Pretty Big Deal, is because like I wanted to have normal conversations, the things that I cared about with cool people, and, and that's it. And then also, you know, be a little weird and goofy. like so Because you can. can. Yeah. Because you can. Because like, that's what people <laughs> want on YouTube. What I also love about YouTube is that there's, there, there is an income in this. It's a real job, basically, is what I'm saying. And you have made it into a fantastic job for yourself. But you've done it consciously. Yes, you'll make videos where you say, like, I'm not getting paid in this video, like your Emirates video. But I want to know, how do you actually find those companies that you care about, that care about you, to say, okay, yes, I want to promote your company? Well, I mean, to, to zoom out a little bit, it's understanding where's the value. Where's right. the value coming from? Right. But the value is in influence. Like, creativity is not as valuable today as the influence mm. that it it that it causes, that is the result of that creativity. I think that respecting that influence and what the origins are of that influence and what that influence means is something that is incredibly delicate and incredibly important to finding financial or long-term success in this world of social media and YouTube and everything else. And I've had my own missteps. I've, I've often struggled. I've, I've done projects that maybe I shouldn't have, projects where um, I was maybe seduced by the check instead of really authentically yeah, but... thinking 
is this what's best for my brand in the long term? Right. I mean, you make those mistakes, but now you're at a place where you're really not. I mean, you you're kind of known as like the socially conscious guy who's making those those decisions because it's something that you love. Yeah, and it gets expensive though. <laughs> Um, I mean it. Like, there's like a huge advertising effort right now coming from Saudi Arabia. They're spending a lot of money okay. to sort of evangelize their efforts in in myriad places, and they're they just opened up uh, tourism to a uh, like a bunch of countries that they didn't have before. Okay. And they've been working with a lot of influencers, but that doesn't agree with sort of what I think is socially okay. So, so therefore, I have to say no. But when you work so hard in this space to to get those opportunities, it's very hard to say no. Mm-hmm. Because you're saying no to one thing, you, you don't know if there's something else behind that. You don't know if there's something more behind that there's, there's going to be another chance. opportunity. That's you're right. That's right. And now everybody wants to be viral. I know. What's, Such what, a gross word. Don't you hate it? But I you've been viral it. so many times. How do you make original content that you feel like, okay, hopefully this is going to go viral? Like, what does that even mean today? There is like an acute definition of, of virality today that did not virality. exist. Virality. That do, did not exist before. Back in the day, it was like a million views. Shit, that must have gone viral. Right. And now it's not. I think now to, for something to go viral means that it goes beyond what its organic audience would have been. Maybe organic's not the right word. You know, m- most videos that I post on my, my YouTube channel do like a million, maybe two million views, okay. which is great. But when I post one that does 20 or 30 million views, that means that that did find that virality. It did mm. go beyond what my normal audience is. Mm. Um, but to the kid in the Midwest who has 13 subscribers and he uploads Minecraft videos and he, he posts something that he thinks is interesting or something that she shot in school that she's really proud of and her videos normally get six views and his videos normally get four views and it gets 1,000 or 5,000 views, that's viral. Right, that's so it's viral. really about the creator. Yeah, I think it's about where it goes. It's about mm. people saying, I want to see that that is that exceeds what would normally be assumed by that audience. And that means viral. We're going to get back to Pretty Big Deal in just a moment. New moms know it's way easier to fill an online cart than push a real life cart with a baby. We're all doing lots of online shopping right now. And my favorite way to do it is with Honey. It's a free tool that automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them at checkout. Hello, game changer. So if you're shopping at one of your favorite stores like Target, Sephora, basically any of them really, all you have to do is click this little box and it automatically applies the best coupons in seconds. Boom. That used to take like 30 minutes on Google and who even knew if you were actually getting the best discount. I've been buying so much for Isaac, but also for me. I've saved 30 bucks on this lounger, hello, that I've been living in. And my friend just told me that she saved $250 on a mattress of all things. It's such a high to see that discount in your cart. (laughs) Love it. And if you don't trust me, trust that 18 million people use Honey and they've helped to save people over two billion. That's right, billion dollars. So I got you guys hooked up. Not using Honey is literally passing up on free money. It's free to use and installs in just a few seconds. Plus, it's backed by PayPal, so you know is good. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. That's joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. And now back to this pretty big deal. Now, I'm not saying that I try to create viral opportunities, but I just feel like everybody's looking for that viral moment. And like you keep hearing brands say, we need a viral moment. We need something. But anytime anything is forced, it never happens. Do you fuck with TikTok? (sighs) I just feel like... It's for the babies. Me too. I'm very, I feel very old on TikTok. Have you done it? I don't know how. I mean, I have an account. And I like sometimes I post stuff. Do you I'm do like, it with your oldest? Hope the kids like that. And it's like six views, and three weeks later, I'm like, well, maybe I'll try harder next time. No, see, I, no, I don't want to do that. Though. But TikTok has taught me that I know nothing <laughs> about how to make something viral, <laughs> because I'll see videos on TikTok that have like 300 million views. And it's just beyond the realm of something I could have considered. And oh I think like gosh. the velocity of that platform is, is, is more so than maybe any other social platform out there. Okay, so I basically I need to get on TikTok. Guys, yep. can we get on TikTok? There we go. But it, TikTok's really shown me that it, it, for something to go viral is almost impossible to define. You heard it here first. Because you don't know what the appetite is. You don't know what the audience wants to see. 
I mean, I love the funny videos on Instagram that just kind of get start getting passed around and they're like, you know, 30 seconds max. And it's just, I don't know, some old lady in the back seat saying something crazy and her wig falls off or her teeth pop out. Did I mean, you see the woman screaming at the other kids and when the kids are like, why are you swearing so much in front of your children? She goes, my children can't hear me right now. They're watching Kids Bop. And the video just exploded. Anybody see the kids? But you saw it? It's so good, isn't it? Yeah. That's a perfect that viral one. moment. See? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you're also really known for your stunts. What do you feel like is the craziest stunt that you've all, like already pulled off or that you pulled off ever? A movie that I made that was actually like one of the most viral movies I've ever made in like 2012 on YouTube was called Bike Lanes. Oh, oh my gosh, I saw this one. It's a good movie. It's so good. It's a really fun movie. My friend, I made my friend Oscar. You got a Boyson. ticket. Yeah, so I, I was riding my bike and I had a ticket from the cops for riding outside the bike lanes. So, like, I showed the ticket at the beginning of the video and then I was made the video where I wouldn't leave the bike lane no matter what. So no matter what was in front of me, I would just go at it. And those stunts were really hard because there was no... It was just me. So like running into the back of a taxi cab at full speed or like running into a garbage can at full speed or like hitting whatever was in front of me. You didn't hurt yourself? No, but I feel like if I were to do it right now, I would definitely hurt myself. <laughs> that was like the very tail end of like being that like having that sense of invulnerability where you can't get hurt. Now I'm very aware of it. What was your biggest uh, video that you ever made that made like a very big social change? Because I know that's important to you as well. Well, the Nike video we talked about a while ago mm -hmm. had such a big impact on my career that after that I got so many offers from other brands and they would always say the same thing. Do for us what you did for Nike. Wow. Do for us what you did. That's Which, a lot of pressure. It got old. Like, I can't do that again. I yeah. did it once. Um, but I remember, I think it was Paramount Pictures, maybe Universal. I'm pretty sure it was Paramount. Right, came to me no, and they're like, Apple. we have a new movie coming out. It's about, like, celebrating the spirit of life. Can you make a video for us that's like your Nike video about that? And this was just that as a huge typhoon had, like, really just ravaged Philip the Philippines. I remember, like, literally the same day I got the offer. Wow. Seeing on TV that people were, like, using axes to try to break through water mains oh my God. so they could just drink water like wow. that was the level of desperation there so i called the studio back and i was like i'll do this if you give me all the cash up front they were going to give me like 25 grand i was like give me all the cash up front and i'm just going to donate it to the philippines and like do this as a gesture and i'll make a video about this donation and they reluctantly were like okay there's one champion within there that was like we'll just let's do it and if this whole thing goes to shit, we're going to pretend this never happened wow but I couldn't give the money away. Nobody would take it. Why? Because in order, of, I was gonna, like I tried to give it to a number of uh, NGOs and they were like, where's this coming from? I'm like, well, it's coming from Paramount Pictures as part of a marketing thing, but they gave it to me and I'm gonna give it to you. And they're like. They didn't it, want to touch it. No, and it makes, I understand. Like it, it's not a good look for them to take money if it's part of an ad. Right, right. So after like a day of researching that, we're like, well, fuck, let's go figure it out. So my buddy Oscar and I just flew to the Philippines with all this money. Right. And we're like, we will figure out how to give this away. So we literally, like, we couldn't get trucks. We rented huge buses. We went to, like, the Costco of the Philippines and bought all of the rice and all of the food stuff so we could afford. And then we, like, drove it in there. We, like, found some, like, locals that were like, you're not allowed to get past those roadblocks and stuff here. We'll show you how to actually get this to the people. And we went there and we distributed it. Um, and we did it all ourselves with the help of locals. Mm. Um, but with, without an established NGO or anything like that. And that's the only ad campaign I've ever done that I lost a significant amount of money. Because it wasn't just a 25 grand. Like right. I was paying for it. Of course, but it's totally worth it. And, and that's, you know, there's moments where we want to give back. And what a great opportunity for you, too. The food we gave away was a drop in the hat. Like right. maybe we helped a few, a few hundred people. It was the best we could do. But that movie was seen by four or five, six million people. Right. And it brought so much attention to what these individuals were dealing with that that attention wildly out, outvalued the small amount of like money and, and food and help that we were able to actually give. And that was the goal. And the only marketing that was in it was at the very end was like, thanks for letting us do this. You work so hard. You have like, you're, you're, you have a lot of videos under your belt, first of all. But I feel like your personal life like must take a hit because I want to know what your routine is. It must be wild. Sleep, eat, exercise. Run me through it, please. Because I heard a rumor you don't like food. I don't like food and I don't like sleep. Like two of my I, least favorite things. I just don't understand that. Sleep, food, the wind. These are things that just exist. The wind? The wind. You don't like the wind? No. Okay, can you please explain the sleep and the food? 
I appreciate them, and I understand that for a human to live and thrive, you need both of those things. But to me, they're just obstructions. They just get in my way. Like, I like I flew here today from from the East Coast. It was okay. like a six hours. So, what did you do on the plane? Well, I slept because I didn't sleep last night, and I wanted to be fully rested for our <laughs> sit down here. And it was such a bummer because, like, I really could have used that five and a half hours to edit this video <laughs> that I'm making, and I wasn't able to because I had to sleep. Did you eat on the plane? No, I was sleeping. <laughs> Did you eat when you landed? No. You don't get hangry? I'm not sure I've eaten yet. No. You don't get hangry? My daughter gets ang- angry. <laughs> Very much so. No, and food, yeah, yeah, if there was a pill that I could take to... Like, it could just fill you up? That's just, yeah. just, like, very strange to me. But you know what? To each his own. And Casey, you've got your own thing going on. I'm glad you brought up your daughter because I've been asking so yeah, many people. Yeah, please. I will like, talk about her baby till the end stuff. of the earth. I need, I need all the baby information that's out there. Do you have any, like, just fatherhood, parenthood advice? I'm having a boy. I didn't know you were having a boy. Yeah. Do you have a name? You have to tell me. No, we, we have a name. Here's a piece of parenting advice. Don't tell anyone the name until he's born. No, I know. We're not. Because you say the name and then one person in your life will be like... That's cute, but you know, instead of that, you know what's cuter is this. And then for the rest of your life, they're going to know your kid, and you're going to be like, how, Trust how me. dare you? I know. I'm not doing it. So Owen, my son that I had when I was very young, he's now 21. 21? Yeah, he's in college. You act like you're 21. We're the same age. <laughs> what's very interesting. Wait, how old? So you're 39? 38? No. 38. Okay. He and then you have two little girls. Two little girls, a one-year-old and an almost five-year-old. Oh. They're really special. So what's the number one takeaway from being a parent that you can say, like, this is what, this is what I want to also, like, remind you that you're about to have this. This is something special. Are you going to keep going? I want to. Okay, okay. The advice is, like, is pay attention. And again, Mm. like, to sound, to not roll my eyes at myself again, it's like, you'll never be able to do it with this little guy. Mm. And poor little man, I'm sorry. But it's just like, you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to sleep. You're trying to deal with your own body, right. your relationship with your husband. Like there's so many yeah. things you're trying to figure out that you, you're going to miss it. Right. It's just the way it works. And then it really motivates you to have another one because the time, by the time the second one comes, all that other bullshit, you like, you like, okay, I got that. Interesting. But now I get to pay attention to and appreciate this little thing. Do you wish you would have like taken more videos, photos, journaled? No. I mean, with, with Owen, it's like, it's, it's, tough but no you were a baby baby because i was a baby and i wish that i had paid attention more Mm. um with my first daughter francine like i wish i had paid attention more and i'm sure like four years from now i'll say like with georgie i wish i had paid attention more are you gonna have another one my wife wants another one immediately (gasps) but no 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 are you gonna go get like no that's too scary i'm are you you know how that works no yes i do do you know what women have to go through i mean i was in the room for three Birds, but no, I'm saying for most of the time. I'm no, for to us to not have children, like you know, to get it permanently done, like it's way more of a thing. We have to get our tubes tied, the whole thing. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. No, either. but men, you go in, it's like a you right, go in, surgery. you go out the same day. Right, but they have to cut near a certain area. I'm irrationally terrified of the second. So then maybe you'll just hey, have another one. Who knows? Speaking of your wife, Candace. Yeah. What? I tried to bring her here today. Why didn't she come? Listen to how good this reason is. She is going to parent-daughter therapy with Francine. The three-year-old? The, yeah, the older, she's four. But four, because, I'm sorry. Because Franny and she and my wife are starting to like, they're like, they're two women in the house. Like, they fight sometimes. That's... And because Candace, you know, has her relationship with her mother and looks back at it, she's like, what do I wish I'd been able to do with my mom more? It's like, I wish I'd had more focused conversations with her. So Candace is doing this with Franny, and they're going. And the most interesting thing is I said to Candace, like, because Candace met with the family therapist before bringing Franny there, how do you phrase it to the little one so she knows what's going on? And the therapist's advice was just explain to her, we're going to go meet with someone to help us better communicate with each other so we don't get mad at each other as often. And, like, it maybe sounds trivial, but in a million years it would never occur to me to be that level of have that level of honesty with a four-year-old but i know my four-year-old that makes sense it's not a lot of that's not that hard to understand you can get that okay yeah me and mommy do fight and scream so any of that she's there right now okay so that's a really good that's such a good excuse and also that's really beautiful i would have never thought to go to therapy with my four-year-old i I think it's the greatest thing and i think francine's just about as early as you can do it 
And you guys have been through a lot of therapy, and you've put it I'm on a YouTube. Huge, yeah, I mean, like, a huge fan of, of therapy in any capacity. But with in a relationship, I always think of it as, like, don't wait till you're sick to go to the doctor. Right. You go to the doctor as for preventative. You get your exams, mm -hmm. and you get checked out to make sure you don't get sick. And with Candace and I, like, I never went. She always did. She's very responsible with, with her own mental health, and I'm, I'm not. And we would get to points where we were really fighting in New York before we mm -hmm. moved here, and especially after the baby was born. And she would drag me to her therapist, and I loved it. And it meant so much to me. And we started mentioning publicly, because we're not shy about this stuff, that we, we go to couples therapy, and people were fascinated by it. So that's when Candace and I started like, okay, well, it's just like, let's do our own thing where we share publicly much more about our relationship and our learnings than maybe we'd ever considered. But I think you do talk about having that work-family balance and what that means for you. And you don't really hear a lot of men talking about that, especially who have families and, and thriving careers. Like, what, what has made you be so honest? Um, I mean, I learned all that from Candace. You did? Yeah. Aww. Like, I'm, my household was like, my, my mother was always like, you fake it till you make it. You smile all the time. When someone asks how you're doing, you say, great. And I realized, like, my mom is, you know, she's in her 60s now, and I'm, I'm almost 40, and it's like, I never have any fucking idea what she's thinking. Wow. Mom, how's life? Great. Like, <sighs> how's it really? Great. Not good. Like, come on. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. Yeah. Nothing. And I remember, like, the first time I ever met Candace, I mean, like, the first time we ever had a conversation, a kind of brutal honesty that was like, whoa, like, no one's ever spoken to me with that level of candor before, ever. And it made me, like, love her. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, if you, if you show someone all your scars, there's not a lot left to discover. And it's like, you know what that person is. Mm -hmm. Like, a squeaky clean bullshit artist is like, you know they're hiding something. Mm -hmm. So with Candace, that's been true. And then, like, as I went to YouTube and sort of opened myself up, and, like, I'm the source of most of the narratives of the videos that I put up, it was just like, honesty is, is not, like, a, a factor, but honesty should be at the core of everything you do. I believe that as well. I'd rather be judged for who I am than be judged for maybe a, a, a misconceived version of who I am. I like that. You're motivated. You've got big dreams. What's next for the business side of things. Long legs is the name of the game. Long legs. Long legs, Ashley. Um, <laughs> and the, the tempo of succeeding in the world of social media is relevance today. Yes. Or relevance not at all. How do you do that? How do you keep up? It's destructive. It is, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's You just have to be yourself. It, you have to be yourself. And when you see these youngsters, like youngsters, when you see these like YouTube stars that are in their early 20s and they're, they're chasing clout 24 seven without much consideration for the longevity of their career, like it's going to go away as fast as they find it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that like my own rate of acceleration for success, like my YouTube channel went from 400,000 subscribers to 10 million in two years. Mm. That's untenable, that cannot be maintained. But it's a scary thing to admit that to yourself. So part of the move, the transition from leaving New York City and moving to Los Angeles is like, okay, I have these two kids that I want to spend a lot of time with. I've, I've done very well financially the last couple of years, very fortunate. So I'm in a position where I shouldn't exclusively be financially motivated right now. Mm -hmm. So what's the big picture goal? Mm -hmm. And for me right now, it's like, can I start to slow things down and shape my career in a way that is long and prosperous? Well, and this is one of your big ambitions is to be a director. Yes. A movie, like a whatever big time movie director? Maybe, whatever my heart desires. But the point is, like, that's his thing. And the right. fact that he's doing it, he's been doing it for this long. Taxi Driver was like 40 years ago. Right. He's still doing it. And he's still doing it really successfully. And he's an old man. That's the dream, and that's my goal now, is like, there's no 80-year-old who's putting out, you know, uh, seven videos a week, 52 weeks a year, right. you know, over and over and over, like, not sleeping to maintain that clout. I don't think... That clout, honey. I don't think Martin Scorsese is, like, being kept up at night because he thinks he might be irrelevant. I think Martin Scorsese is operating on what is the best movie I can make. What's I the most right. artistic thing I can do? What's the way that I can like exercise my artistic ambitions as best as possible? I think and I, I want that to be my driving force. I think you're taking care of yourself mentally, like I'm by trying, doing that and so saying hard. it out loud. I think it's very important. What's next for Mr. Casey Neistat? I'm working on a big project right now, like a longer term, the first sort of foray into longer terms, like a feature length documentary. Okay. What's um, it about? Can it's you... about YouTube culture. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I just think that like in the Venn diagram of traditional filmmakers, I've made a bunch of 
couple of feature films before. I've made documentaries before. I've done all that. Plus YouTubers that have experienced this like rapid success that I was lucky enough to experience in the last couple of years. The overlap between those two is really narrow. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of, I find myself in the middle of that. I think I know how to tell these bigger stories. And I also experienced this really wild thing. So can I take this understanding and maybe this skill set and combine the two and make something that captures this inflection point that we're at right now in the world of media, that's compelling. Wow, um, let me know how I can support you because that sounds awesome. That's the focus right now. Wow. But then I still gotta make those YouTube videos. I gotta get that clout. Shoot. Can't let it go away. You busy. There's one more thing that we, we do on Pretty Big Deal. Okay. We do a live boldly lightning round. Okay, I'm ready. What's the last pretty penny you spent? Can I tell you the last pretty penny that Candace spent? Because it's way cooler than the last pretty penny that I spent. Fine. Okay, okay, okay. My wife, when she was in high school, had a dream car. And when she was in high school, it was like the 90s. So it was like a 1996, 1997 Toyota Land Cruiser, like the big SUV. That was her dream car. Okay. She never got it because she was a high school student. Okay, so we moved to California. She found that exact car, a 1997 Toyota Land Cruiser, in like mint condition, like a perfect one, like a museum quality car. And? And she bought it. How much was it? Like $40,000. <gasps> yes, Candace. And you can't finance a 30 year old, 1997, 22 year old car. Jeez. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I'm okay. Need, I might need to borrow a few bucks, but I, we can <laughs> talk about that off camera. What's the biggest deal breaker for you? A socially responsible disconnect. If we don't see eye to eye about the social implications of anything I'm doing professionally, it's deal breaker. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And because you're a pretty big deal and we're on pretty big deal, what's a pretty big deal to you? Be nice to people. Be nice. That's a big one. And a lot of people say that because I think in some aspects it's underrated and we need to do more of it. But a lot of people say it and don't do it. I just think there are more opportunities and more ways to be mean to people now than there's ever been. This is also true. And you have to be, it takes a lot of strength to be able to resist that. Yeah. When someone gives you shit on Twitter, it takes everything you've got to not respond to that tweet. I hate Twitter. You gotta be nice. Ah! Casey, thank you so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate Good it. Good luck. Thank I you. Wait to, I can't wait to meet him. I know, I can't oh, either. Oh, she's here right now hanging out. <laughs> he can hear, he's been kicking the whole time. Oh, he loves this interview. He was just like, these are great questions, Mom. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Don't forget to join the conversation on social. Follow us, Pretty Big Deal, on Instagram and Twitter. And send us all your questions and comments. We want to hear from you.